Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, we are now going to head into our second session. And uh, I'm Andrea Farney again, I'm your host today. Thank you again so much for our first session. That was amazing. Uh, we're uh, going to now move into the pipeline efforts to promote diversity and multi-generational perspective. Since we're starting five minutes late, we're gonna give them an extra five minutes at the end. So yes, we will have lunch break for you. Just look for that at 1235. This session is moderated by Sharon Barney. And Sharon is a partner with Leach Tishman and a member of the Immigration Law, Family Law, and Employment Practice Groups. Uh, she's based in uh, Leach Tishman State College Office and focuses her practice in the areas of immigration and family law matters. Ms. Barney is an active member of the state college community and headed the first multicultural unity fair in Center County in 2018. She is a graduate of Northeastern University School of Law and also attended undergrad the University of Rochester. Ms. Barney is the current president of the Center County Bar Association. That's a full stop moment. Sharon, thank you for bringing this panel idea to fruition uh, with your thoughts of, of doing a multi-generational panel and we're excited to have our speakers and we're looking forward to, to your discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and I, I wanted to, I was glad that we had a break because there was a lot in that first session, a lot of really, really great action items and things to consider. Um, in thinking about the uh, panel um, that Sharon Lopez and I put together, um, we knew it was important to have um, different perspectives, a multi-generational perspective. And we believe this is the first time that um, we've had a multi-generational perspective like this, talking about diversity um, in the profession. Um, I, I want it, even though I'm moderating, I want to uh, take some time and thank Sharon Lopez who helped create um, this panel with me. We talked through a lot of it and um, we enjoy being Team Sharon when we, uh, when we work together on conferences and other uh, CLEs and things together. Um, so again, thank you, Sharon. Um, as was mentioned before, we started playing the Diversity Summit generally and also this panel prior to COVID-19 hitting. Um, and while the issue of having a multi-generational perspective on diversity was important prior to COVID, it's even more important now. Um, there was concern that due to the impact on the legal community and our economy um, based off of COVID, diversity and inclusion programs and its importance will fall by the wayside as happened in 2008 during the economic downturn. And a lot of times diversity um, and inclusion programs um, and our diverse lawyers and other staff are the first to be cut um, when economic issues hit. Um, you saw and heard the sad and meager numbers uh, during the first panel uh, during the first session on how the number of black attorneys has not changed in, in the past 10 years in our profession. Um, and as was mentioned, it will take large structural ongoing change to um, have any sort of impact on these numbers in the future. Window dressing and doing diversity efforts because it's nice will not move the needle forward. Um, our goal during this panel is to provide three perspectives from lawyers or soon to be lawyers um, as we do have one law student on our panel um, so that we can learn from their experiences and work towards efforts in our profession to promote, attract, and retain minority voices. Um, and you saw uh, during the first session, you know, this downward trend of even having the small number of uh, diverse law students and how that number tapers off over time. Um, so it's especially important that we uh, wanted to make sure that we heard from a, a law student's perspective um, as they're the future of the profession. They will be our co-counsel, opposing counsel, judges, um, our friends and colleagues. Um, before we begin, I want to encourage comments and questions in the chat, just, um, just like we kind of had during the first session. I may not get to all the questions as I know that our panelists have prepared their own statements ahead of time and we wanted to make sure that they 
gave the full amount of their experiences. Um, but I will make sure and do my best to go through the chat and try to find questions um, for, for everyone. Um, so first we will start with Daniel Mateo, um, who is the most seasoned of our panelists. Um, Mr. Mateo is an experienced litigation and business disputes partner in Holland and Knight's Philadelphia office. Um, he has over 25 years of litigation arbitration experience, um, and he recognizes that successful outcomes require a strategy that's informed by the nature of the dispute, the amount of controversy, client's objectives, and risk tolerance to the adversary in the venue. Um, as a native Spanish speaker of Puerto Rican descent um, and an active and engaged member of the Hispanic National Bar Association, he was also the past president of the Hispanic Bar Association of New Jersey. Um, Mr. Mateo regularly mentors young lawyers and strongly supports Bar Association diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, so uh, Dan, I wanted to ask you, since you are the most seasoned uh, panelists that we have, having been a lawyer for over 30 years, what do you think has changed in our profession and where do we need to go? Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, before I tackle uh, Sharon's uh, question, um, I too wanna echo the comments about this morning's session. Uh, it was quite powerful and, and, and moving. Um, just when you think uh, you are the most seasoned person on the panel, you recognize that you still have plenty to learn. Um, so I'd like to thank the Pennsylvania Bar Association, uh, the Montgomery Bar Association, PBI, and everyone for inviting me here today. Um, just for a little context, um, you know, I, I never thought I would be seasoned um, <laughs> um, or be the seasoned member of, of this panel. Um, but, but for context, I went to Rutgers undergrad and uh, graduated from Penn Law in 93. Um, and so over the last 30 years, I've seen a lot of changes in our profession. Um, and um, some changes uh, for the better, quite frankly, um, some changes for the worse, and a lot of things that have just stayed the same. Um, very little change, lots of talk, little change. Um, but I think what I'm seeing today, having the 93 uh, graduating class, uh, we graduated into an economic recession. And so the comments about resilience and um, being creative and being forward thinking is it definitely resonates. I saw as a practicing lawyer, the last recession in 2008 and how that impacted people of color uh, and diverse lawyers uh, at firms, in-house and government. And now I see again, the impact and we do as minority lawyers and diverse lawyers have challenges that are unique. Um, but I'm gonna put that, I, I really wanna approach this from a perspective of opportunity and a perspective of hope. Um, because yes, things have not changed. But what I see today that's different is that there is an incredible amount of opportunity for us to capture. So I've practiced, I'm Puerto Rican descent, not just the Puerto Rican descent, but I grew up economically disadvantaged, poor. I grew up in Camden. Um, I am also openly gay. So that creates a lot of issues in terms of how I identify um, how people view me, um, and but I'm light-skinned. And I recognize and I have seen how that allows me to navigate um, in different ways and to have access or presumption of access that many of my colleagues of color don't have. So um, my, my experience is completely big firm. Um, 
So I don't have the perspective of a smaller firm. I don't have the perspective of government or public interest. And so that filters some of my comments as well. Um, so I, it's a long-winded uh, context, Sharon, to your question, because I think it's important for the audience to understand who the comments are coming from and what my experience is what my experiences are that shape the comments that, that I'm going to make. But what I see today um, is an incredible amount of opportunity for diverse lawyers at large law firms. And I see that in a very intentional and unprecedented way. It feels tangible to me, it feels real. And it will be up to us to see if A, we can take advantage of that. And B, it's, is it sustaining or is it just the, the talk of the moment? So uh, I think that that's generally the perspective I wanna hear from other people, but I do think that we have an opportunity that we can seize upon uh, to uh, gain additional positions of power within law firms and within corporate legal departments, and that we should not um, allow that opportunity uh, to slip through our hands and, quite frankly, to hold people accountable um, when they're offering those opportunities uh, to ensure that it, the speak is backed up by action. So I'm going to stop there and um, see if you have any other questions for the rest of the panel. Yeah, Daniel, and I, um, I appreciate you kind of giving that context um, and providing more information about yourself as we, as we talk through some of these things. I was really um, interested in hearing, you know, you said there are some things that have gotten better and some things, you know, the majority of things have kind of remained the same. Um, but you also mentioned that there are some things that have gotten worse. And I guess I'm interested, again, based off of your experience over this many years, what, what do you feel are some things that have gotten better, but also have gotten worse? I, I think the business of law has become more competitive than ever. Um, I think that that competitive nature um, sometimes forces people to circle the wagons and to be more exclusionary than inclusionary. So I, I do believe that from from a competitiveness perspective, there's so much business focus that diversity, the diversity conversation becomes incidental oftentimes because it's also more than ever, it is about the bottom line. And quite frankly, what I've seen is law firms moving more to being businesses than being a profession. And so from that perspective, I think things have gotten worse um, because there, if it's not justified by a business imperative, then it's much harder to find the time and the money uh, to back up different initiatives, um, young law student mentoring, um, community outreach, pro bono efforts uh, and different types of diversity engagement, it becomes much harder to justify. And in that sense, I think it's become worse. Well, and I think to kind of echo what you were saying, you know, for our diversity efforts, you know, there's no way that, there are concrete measurables that you can look at. You know, we can look at the uh, numbers over the past 10 years of, um, minority attorneys becoming partners, for example. That's something that's measurable. But I think what you were talking about where somehow we have to justify diversity by looking at a specific return on investment for every diversity interaction that we have. You know, that's something that sometimes I feel. If I, um, you know, how does um, being involved in something that's related to diversity and inclusion directly come back to, did this increase profit? Did I get a client from it? How soon did I get a client from it? You know, those types of things. And I think that that's um, why it's so difficult to kind of do these structural changes. Um, but you had also talked about how there are many opportunities as well. And you see this as an exciting time. So I wanted to hear from you 
what are, um, what are some concrete opportunities that you think are present at this time? Yeah, I, I think it is um, the right time uh, for us to own our diversity. Um, I think it is important for us to be out as Latino, out as LGBT, um, and really um, insist that management, uh, law firm management in particular, hear us and see us for who we are. And I, there's an incredible opportunity that I see when, when you're willing to take that risk. Um, when you step out um, and step up in terms of race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation, it actually has the effect of quickly testing your organization's commitment to diversity. You might not always like what you hear, but you can <laughs> quickly determine whether you're in the right place. Um, and I have found that by, by being very out in every aspect of who I am as a person, I have been able to raise my visibility at the firm. I have been able to um, increase my voice um, on, on my behalf and other diverse lawyers. Um, I was telling Rachel, Dylan and you, I'm an equity partner. Um, and there's a certain amount of privilege that comes with that. Um, and I recognize that, right? I am not encouraging Rachel <laughs> necessarily as an, a younger associate, you have to, there is a more delicate dance that sometimes you have to do based on your position. But now that I am in a position of privilege as an equity partner at a law firm, it is incumbent upon me to speak up, to speak out and to be very proud about who I am in a really strong and visible and unapologetic way to make it easier for Rachel and Dylan and people like Rachel and Dylan to come up behind me. Um, and that for those of us who are seasoned, we can't just hide and coast our way out of the profession. We have to make sure that we are, we are just more than collecting a paycheck that we're standing up and that we're being super visible to represent communities that have been typically underrepresented and to make sure that people understand that we're here and we're successful and there are plenty of us behind that are coming behind. And the last thing I wanna say is I've been telling a lot of my partners you know, the people who are now becoming major decision makers at corporations that are hiring lawyers like me are diverse. So if you cannot have that conversation and you do not understand that trend and that dynamic, then you are not going to be competitive. So it's almost like you need to know me. <laughs> um, <laughs> access, you know, you. It is, it is owning our own power and it's recognizing that people like us are now becoming decision makers and we are hopefully the bridge into companies and into workflows that some of our white colleagues may not have access to. And that to me is exciting. That's great, Daniel. And I know that we're getting some questions kind of about what you were talking about with the business focus and kind of the business case for um, keeping diverse uh, attorneys and hiring uh, diverse attorneys. Um, from my own perspective, like I said, you know, it's, it's often difficult to try to um, have that ROI of, well, I'm a part of this. And so that equals X amount of dollars that I brought in. But I think it kind of goes to what you were talking about, the inherent value that we bring, you know, with everything that we bring by being our true selves. Um, and that's the business perspective that I think, you know, my whole book of business, my expertise, my leadership skills, you know, those are things that bring in business um, to, to uh, my firm. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that, because I know that there is a question about um, in-house um, legal departments, uh, 
concrete steps that law firms and, and in-house can do to kind of try to make that um, business case for diversity? Yeah, there, you know, I, I struggle with that, Sharon. I, 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 I'm again, I'm getting to that age where I don't feel like I need to justify my existence. I don't feel like we need to be justifying, hey, you, um, please give me access or pay for my bar membership because there's a business case for it. Um, so I want us to perhaps think about that a little differently, but I think that from my perspective, so much of what I was taught as a young lawyer was, Dan, put your head down, be a good lawyer, really learn the skills before you sort of rise up and start mm -hmm. thinking about the business development. And I think that advice is old advice. I think it was well-intentioned, but it did not serve me well. Um, uh, my white colleagues didn't do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, they focused on being good lawyers, but they did not keep their head down as long as I did. They didn't. They were out there developing business and making connections way before I did because I just didn't feel I was quite ready. I didn't feel like I was quite good enough. And therefore, before I stepped on, onto the stage of business development, I wanted to make sure that my skills were beyond reproof. And that puts me in a situation where I'm playing catch up. So from, a, from yes, we have to be good lawyers. Yes, you have to be technically proficient, um, but from a, a, a ROI perspective, we need to start getting out there and building relationships and investing in our own business development skills much earlier than we are typically taught to do because it is business development that is really honestly candidly, the single metric that will determine how you're heard and how you are perceived. So for diverse lawyers to really gain power, we must focus on business development and learning those skills and teaching one another um, how to do that much earlier than we typically have and start having that conversation with other minority lawyers and law students to say, yes, be good. But part of being good is learning a skill set that many of us are not comfortable with, with, which is selling and developing business with confidence. That's great. Thank you so much, Daniel. And, um, and that's a great point to um, move on to, I guess, Rachel's presentation, because I know in our uh, preparation for this panel, um, we, Rachel had talked about the business development aspect of things. Um, and um, I'm gonna give her that opportunity to, to give more of her perspective on that. Um, but I, I wanted to move on to introduce Rachel Hadrick, who's next on our panel. Um, Ms. Hadrick is an associate in the litigation and automotive dealership groups of Ms. McNeese, Wallace, and Murek. Um, she handles commercial litigation matters, consumer disputes, class actions, and administrative law matters. She received her BM summa cum laude from uh, Lebanon Valley College in 2006 and her JD magna cum laude from Widener University School of Law in 2013. Um, while in law school, Ms. Hadrick served as the editor-in-chief of the Widener Law Journal um, and participated in the Harrisburg Civil Legal Clinic. Um, she assisted students as an academic support fellow for first year legal research and writing courses and was an active member of several student organizations, including the local chapter of the Black Law Students Association, serving as its president in 2011 to 2012. Um, uh, Rachel is also a uh, key member of uh, the Minority Bar Committee, and she chairs the Central Pennsylvania Minority Law Day um, Committee for us. Um, so. Moving on to, to Rachel, um, you know, as a, as a fellow woman of color um, who's coming up on 10 years of practice next year, um, I, I'm wondering, you know, I, I'm interested in hearing from you, how 
how you're still here, <laughs> how you're still here in the profession. Because as we saw um, over the past 10 years, I think we discussed this, the number of women of color that remain in the profession after the 10 year mark actually goes down. Um, it, it's just one of those metrics. Um, what strategies have you undertaken to remain in the profession and to survive? Um, well, thank you. Um, it's an interesting question. It hasn't been without, you know, ups and downs and learning lessons. I will say like, Daniel, I am probably behind the curve when it comes to the business development aspects. Um, and, you know, thinking about this presentation and uh, there was an article in the legal intelligencer about, you know, attorneys of color leaving big firms. Um, just thinking about my network, um, one of the things that I did right away, um, becoming a lawyer was I was active in the community and um, active in, you know, the Bar Association and um, got pretty qu quickly on the board of a local, um, the Boys and Girls Club and was doing so many things um, as far as my volunteer work. Um, but I found that my network, my personal social network um, that's important to me and that pours into me and that you know loves on me when things are wrong um, still tended to be uh, kind of in the same situation I was um, as a person of color you know we've come a long way and it's true that you know people of color are becoming the decision makers but uh, this problem isn't you know, the diversity problem is not just in the legal industry. So what I've found is that often my, my, my personal network is um, not necessarily the decision makers, right? So um, when it comes to, you know, being connected with those individuals who are going to be the ones who are going to be able to give you business, um, my personal network doesn't necessarily contribute to that in the same way, you know, uh, you know, a non-person of color would have, and even my familial relationships don't offer me that same opportunity, um, you know, in the same way that it might even do for, for, you know, there are gender differences, but, you know, maybe a white woman has familial relationships that can open those doors of opportunity. So especially as a woman of color, I realized that my network is much different. And then, you know, networking can be much different as a woman um uh, and, and those dynamics um and so you know having having to learn to sell myself again danielle said something that really really um stuck out to me that i had written in my notes is that um one of the things i kind of learned up learned um from my community and my family was as a person of color i need to put my head down and i needed to work hard and that my work would speak for itself and that's not right at all when it, especially in private practice. Um, and I've had to complete a total mind shift, a way of thinking that I am still in the early stages of when it comes to um, internally, like within the firm and externally selling myself and not being afraid to talk about my accomplishments and you know, pointing out like, I need to get credit for this because I worked on this and not just taking one for the team. Um, because I, as again, as people of color, we often learn that if we uh, ask for things that we need um, or um, speak up, then we're, we're, we're concerned about complaining or, um, you know, that we can't handle it. And, um, you know, it's, to me, it's gotten to the point where, you know, I've been working with an executive coach that's been uh, an amazing help to me to have someone, you know, who is objective and not necessarily the person I'm going to be asking for help for, or, you know, a friend, um, someone I can just bounce off those ideas and she'll challenge me and say, like, why can't you ask for that? Why can't, why can't right. you ask for those things? But as um, a person of color and as a woman of color specifically, I think that, you know, some we've put these kind of almost 
ridiculous expectations on ourselves to not ask for anything to get things done you know this there's a the stereotype of the strong black woman like we just get things done at all costs and it's like why <laughs> if other people are you know getting what they need you need to do that too why do you expect yourself to overcome in the face of everything um, or without the res the tools and the resources that you need. So those are things that slowly but surely um, I'm working on shifting my mindset to change those things. Um, and I think it can be important for those who want to support attorneys of color to be um, aware and intentional about even helping people work through those um, kind of mindsets that they have. And, you know, not that they're, sorry, I. I don't want to put it as a as a negative mindset, but I think in the context of racism, um, people of color have learned different ways to compensate and to survive, and they may not necessarily always be beneficial to them in the long run. Um, so within that context, sometimes we have to unlearn those unlearn those practices um, to advance. That's great, and I and I guess you talked about having executive coach kind of helped train your mindset as being a um, something that was positive that helped get you through. What are some other things that you found in your career that really have helped um, get you through things, whether that's hobbies, professional development, support system, specific concrete things that you think really helped you to, um, to be able to make it to where you are today? I think mentors internally and ex like in the firm and outside of the firm have helped. Um, again, sometimes it's good to have someone who, um, you know, is objective and there's no, um, you know, concern about, you know, will they tell someone else or um, that type of thing. Um, internal, you need internal mentors though, because, you know, each firm has its own culture, has its own politics and having someone that can help you kind of navigate certain certain issues, you know, there are certain, um, you know, just historical type of things that like, okay, this is not going to change, you need to learn to work around it, or there are other people who feel the same way. And, you know, you could add to kind of the voices and help the situation change. So having mentor and even mentors outside of the legal industry because again I think a lot of times as lawyers we can get caught up in the way we think um and you know our risk assessment especially being a litigator it's like always like okay I can't do this because of the risk and having people outside of the legal context can help you put some things into you know the right frame of reference as well um yeah I mean what do you look for in a mentor, Rachel, whether internally or externally? What are you looking for? Um, affirmation is important, but also, again, I, I it's been helpful for me to have someone kind of take what I say and say it back to me in a different way and challenge my way of thinking. Um, again, for me, I grew up in a, a family um, that I wouldn't say wasn't well off, but um, a family of service, um, people in service industries, teachers, ministers, um, and, and union, union, union employees. So for me, again, that idea of selling myself and not just putting my head down and working hard and hoping that someone notices has been extremely difficult, you know, that shift in mindset. Um, it's just been something that's been ingrained in me to just let others acknowledge you and don't acknowledge yourself. And um, I'm realizing slowly that, that that's not going to work very well, you know, as I progress and to make a name for myself. Well, and I think that, you know, when we were coming up with um, written materials um, for our panel today, we talked about takeaways that people are going to have. And hopefully from hearing your experiences and things that helped and things that didn't necessarily help, um, that can lead to takeaways. But I know that one thing that we concretely discussed when we we're talking about mentors is, especially if you're in a leadership position, um, or even if you're looking for a mentor, 
to not kind of have a, a specific perspective on what you're looking for. Um, I have had uh, mentors, you know, I think sometimes there's a push to have, um, to assign mentors and mentees based off of gender and race, you know, um, and, or if there's only one person who's LGBTQ, that person is automatically going to be assigned to the mentee that's also LGBTQ. Um, but that, even though it provides uh, a unique perspective or a different perspective, it doesn't always mean that it's going to be the best mentor for what you're looking for. Um, and I've had mentors who are, um, you know, older white male mentors who gave me the affirmation and confidence and things like that. Um, and I've had others who tried to serve as mentors who were unable to, even though we fit these, the same diversity boxes. Um, and so I, I wanted to um, kind of make sure that we discuss that um, as well, that there isn't, um, you know, a, the specific perspective that we have to look for. And I really like how you kept it. Somebody who affirms me, you know, somebody who, who repeats things and validates things back to me. Um, so I know that there are a couple of other uh, questions in the comments. And like I said, we will get to them, but I wanted to um, thank Rachel. And I wanna make sure that I get to um, uh, Dylan Grayson, who is our last panelist before we kind of open things up a little bit more. Um, so Dylan Grayson, um, again, who is the only law student panelist we have for the whole summit, he's being very brave by being a part of this, and he just completely signed on and said yes when I asked him to be a, a part of this uh, summit panel, um, is a second year law student at Widener University, um, Widener University Commonwealth Law School. Um, he's a member of the Black Law Students Union, uh, the Alpha Delta, the Latin American Law Students Association, and he serves as a Lexis Nexus ambassador. Um, he's a law student member of the Dauphin County and Pennsylvania Bar Associations. Um, he recently interned um, at Post and Shell over the summer. Um, and before he entered law school, he interned for the Washington County Court of Common Pleas with the Honorable Michael Lucas and for the Office of Mayor Byron Brown in Buffalo. Um, and uh, I, I believe that uh, Dylan is originally from Buffalo, New York. Um, he uh, attended Canisius High School in Buffalo and Washington Jefferson College, where he received his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and a minor in History. So Dylan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, and I, to kind of follow along with this idea of mentorship, um, and based off of your um, affiliations and, and activities that you have um, in law school right now, um, do you have mentors um, right now that are helping you or, or what are you looking for as a law student for a mentor? Um, I would say, yes, I do have mentors. Um, but I guess before I go into the question, I did want to <laughs> say thank you for uh, you know, allowing me to speak um, and be a part of the panel. Um, even though during our meetings, I was a little nervous. I didn't really know what I was going to say. I really think it kind of shifted after hearing some of uh, what I heard today uh, in the previous sessions and just seeing a lot of the issues of our, our country's currently facing and really gave me some inspiration to kind of dedicate myself to getting something for to say for the uh, panel. So thank you for that. But um, for me, I feel like I've had a lot of mentors throughout my life in general, um, and especially in law school, um, you know, to name a few, I guess, of the more official um, mentor-mentee relationships. I've been, you know, I've known Andrea Farney since my, I wanna say, second month in my 1L year, um, and Latasha Williams, who's a Whitener grad. Um, <clears throat> And after my first semester, when I didn't do as well as I thought I would, they were both there and you know, willing to talk to me and kind of counsel and coach me through it. And so I was very appreciative for that. Um, I met Anthony Cox, who's another um, Widener, Widener, Widener grad. And you know, over the summer when I had questions about actually working in the, in the legal field um, and wanted to bounce some ideas off of him, he was there, there to talk to me, there to, you know, someone I could reach out to, um, even to go back to undergrad when I was thinking about and really learning about the law school process. Um, I had two great mentors who were the pre-law advisors and political science professors, Dr. Masawa <clears throat> and Dr. Desaro at Washington and Jefferson. 
Um, so I've been very fortunate to have a lot of mentors, um, both officially, I guess, and more unofficially. Um, and I really think that, you know, the mentor mentee kind of relationship or that whole dynamic, um, it, it, it doesn't always have to be more of an official thing. I think throughout one's career, one's whatever they do, you'll, you'll see and meet a lot of people who have had a hand in really, I guess, opening the door for you um, in ways that you really may never know. Um, over the summer, one of the attorneys I was working for at um, Post and Shell, he you know, told me his story as another black attorney in the profession. And when he was working on the case and <clears throat> working for the general counsel of one company, and the, the individual said something along the, uh, along the lines of just being a little racist or racist. And um, when he actually met this person face to face, it was a completely different dynamic. And he became immediately apologetic for his statements. But, you know, I think as a mentee, you have to realize that the people who are the mentors obviously are older, more seasoned, more experienced, and they've opened the door for you to walk through or, you know, when that door wasn't open or they couldn't open the door, they opened a window, they got through it, and then they came back around and opened the door for you, so. What are your hopes, you know, Dylan, because you are the only, um, law student, I guess, representative that we have talking about diversity and your experience. What, what are your hopes for your future in the profession? Um, and what are your, I guess, concerns or fears of entering the profession? As, as safe as you feel sane. Uh, well, I guess my first hope is to, to find a job. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I... I, I guess my 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 hope is to to leave a positive impact on people. Um, you know, I I got into the whole idea of wanting to go to law school and wanting to be an attorney um, just because of to go back to my my high school um, upbringing. I guess the the aspect of of service uh, a big part of. Um, Canisius High School was a Jesuit school was being a man for others and um, serving your community and helping others um, and giving back and that really stuck with me personally and I, I would say that kind of I'm so sorry that's my cat she's running around right now um, but that kind of intensified for me when I was able to go to the University of Baltimore um, law school Charles Hamilton Houston program and, you know, learn about the man who killed Jim Crow and see that through the law and through the opportunities that you have in the legal profession, you can be a driver of change and help others. Um, so that's really what inspired me, so to say, um, so to speak, and being able to try to help others. Like I'm looking back at my floor and I have a stack of LSAT books and I'm mailing out to one of my friends who's, you know, currently in the same position I was. So, so uh, yeah, to, I guess to answer your question, to try to give back um, as much as possible to those below. And I know that this, so I'm, I'm giving you a big question, a big philosophical question, <laughs> but hopefully it can help others kind of think through concrete action steps that they can take. Um, what are some changes that you think should happen in an ideal situation to help you as a law student right now, as a law student of color? Um, what, what do you think um, has hurt um, your, your ability to kind of move through uh, law school and the profession? So I guess what, what can we do to help um, law students of color and what is hurting law students of color? I would say you'd have to go back to, I don't know how far you have to go back to, but um, for me, 
what I guess kind of hindered me um, was not knowing the process as well as some of my um, my peers. Um, you know, my mom's not a lawyer, my dad's not a lawyer. Um, the only, you know, reason I knew about applying to law school and the things that follow was because of Dr. Desaro and Dr. Masawa helping me through that process. Um, I would say maybe some more efforts to educate people who aren't as advantaged as others that have, you know, attorneys that they know um, or someone they can reach out to um, for advice and navigating the, okay, I want to do this, but how do I get there? Um, because if you don't know how to even start, then you'll, you'll never get there, I guess. Um, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Things that you think might be hurting, you know, your your ability to kind of make it through law school or the profession or things that have hurt that have impacted you? Um, I actually recently read a, um, a paper I found on LinkedIn. It's called, um, it was more of a case study um, of a hundred black law students who took this survey um, given by this, this student, David Akire. And the, the common sentiment was that what I just expressed that, you know, a lot of people don't have the knowledge to know what to do. Um, and then a big part of it is that they feel excluded in some spaces and while they're in law school, um, they don't feel as if a lot of the more presti prestigious jobs are available to them or within reach. So I would say making deeper efforts and, you know, deeper pipeline efforts to help those individuals still learn and know that these opportunities are available to you and what opportunities are actually out there. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Dylan. Um, and so I guess at, at this point, we're going to open things up to some questions. Now's the time if you, um, if we haven't gotten to a question, I'm, I'm going to go back to, um, ask, uh, try to get to some of the questions I, I missed. Um, but if you do have a question, you can, um, you can ask it now. So I wanted to get to one of the questions about, and, and this is open to um, Dylan, Rachel, and Daniel. Um, would someone like to address the notion of attorneys of color being called upon to be the diverse perspective time and time again, leading to burnout and and exhaustion. And I recognize the fact that we're a panel of all people of color giving our time to give the diverse perspective of our generation, right? So I recognize that. But I'm wondering if we can give some advice and talk about how we got through some of those things and what it means to us. So this is kind of open to, to anybody. Uh, I'll start. I mean, I think that, um, Again, I'm, I'm starting to look at these things not as burdens, but opportunities. And I 100% agree with the burnout, but it's time that we um, extract something for it. There are some strings attached. You want me to be um, at the Bar Association. You want me to take additional time to serve in certain roles. Okay, what am I going to get out of that? Um, and using those as opportunities to um, get the firm to value your time and your contribution. So what I would say is don't necessarily shy away from it. Yes, it's a burden, but it's also an opportunity. Most of my business and most of the relationships to Rachel's point, I don't have an, a personal network. Mm -hmm. I had to build one from scratch. And so I used to view these diversity and bar association events as additional burdens on my time. And now I view them as opportunities. And I also use them as leverage with the firm to extract either additional credits on my hours or additional marketing budgets or additional access to marketing personnel. So use those, what, what might traditionally be a burden 
Let's figure out how to use it to our advantage as an opportunity to build the networks that we may not inherently um, have access to. That's what I would suggest. To, to, if I could add to that, um, again, I think sometimes it can be a mindset shift. I would agree. I, I haven't gotten, you know, I'm not to the place where Daniel is where I've been able to, um, you know, negotiate certain trade-offs for participation, but um, I'll be really frank. I think as a, I would encourage all attorneys of color to realize that you are an asset to your firm, that you are imperative. Um, your presence is imperative right now um, with the national conversation on race um, going on more companies are asking law firms what their, what the makeup of their law firms are. Um, you know, what are they doing to, you know, ensure the, the well-being of their attorneys of color? What initiatives are they working on? And so for me, I learned to, and, and, and I'll, I'll also mention that I did, before I went to law school, I actually worked full time as a diversity affairs professional for four years in higher education. So this is, I do have some, you know, experience in that in that arena as well. But learning to take some of the th the experiences that we have and say like I add value to this organization with those experiences and and understand that even if people don't necessarily say that out loud to you you have to learn that you do offer and you bring something to the table with your experiences and move forward with that. Great. Um, I got a, a couple of questions, pointed questions, um, but I'm gonna wrap it up uh, into one kind of general question from Sharon Lopez <laughs> for both Daniel and Rachel. So her questions were, uh, what role has Bar Association work helped or hurt your advancement? And what are, your, what are you still looking for from the Bar Association to help you? Rachel, why don't you kick it off? <laughs> so <laughs> um, I think that uh, participation in the Bar Association has been invaluable to be both the minority bar committee, I'll say that, um, connecting me with other attorneys of color who are also in private practice. There are a handful of us in central Pennsylvania, but not that many, um, you know, both of the Sharons, everyone, Daniel, I'm going to be like picking your brain all the time now, um, after this is over, um, since you've made it, um, shout out to Latoya Bellamy, who's in the Harrisburg area and is a partner at Edgar Siemens, but, um, having, just having that network of people, because, um, there are some days at work, I'll say that, especially in central Pennsylvania, like I may not interact with another person of color, clients or other attorneys. Um, so being able to interact and share those experiences are very important to me and affirming to me as a person. Um, I thought I was going to say something else. Oh, and, and as far as what I need, I also um, will say that I was a member. I forget what year I was a class of the Board Leadership Institute. <laughs> it wasn't that many years ago, but um, that program was invaluable to me. I, we still have my um, bar class still has a group chat. Um, so we um, exchange ideas. You know, if someone has a quick question about an area of law, we talk through that. We ask if, you know, is there someone who practices this area of law in this region since we're from all over the state? Um, so those are lifetime friendships that I've made with the Bar Leadership Institute. I don't know if every class is, I like to think our class was super uh, close, but um, that was a great um, program to be part of. But I will also say that um, what I would like is more opportunities to participate in substantive areas that I am, um, you know, that I practice in and have some, some knowledge in. Um, and so, and speaking opportunities, yeah. So um, I know, I know there has been an effort um, with the Bar Association um, to make sure that 
attorneys of color are, you know, considered for speaking opportunities, but I hope to participate in that and get more opportunities for speaking engagements on substantive areas. That's great. And Daniel? Uh, so I, I was a, a little bit of a late bloomer when it came to um, bar associations. Uh, again, under the theory that I just had to be at my desk and work. Um, but bar association participation has been absolutely critical in terms of um, not feeling isolated, um, to Rachel's point. Um, but, but I think in, in response to Sharon's question, I think it's important that we thought, think about bar association involvement much more broadly than simply our local bar or um, diverse lawyers shouldn't limit themselves to participation in diversity bars like Hispanic bar or national bar. We should, um, to build that network, Rachel, we should be in the ABA. We should be in the American Health Lawyers Association. We should be in bar associations that complement the substantive areas that you're practicing in because that's where the referral network is. And so oftentimes, we feel most comfortable in a bar association with people that look like us and that's great. Um, and we need that sort of support and mentorship, but we should also be thinking about bar association involvement much more broadly to support our careers and to build our networks. Yeah, if I could just respond to that, I think that's one of the um, kind of burdens that we bear as attorneys of color, I, at least I feel that way sometimes, is that um, there are things that I need to do to sustain myself, right? <laughs> um, like I said, if I go through all day and I don't interact with a, another person of color, for me personally, that's, um, I need to replenish myself emotionally in that situation and, and, and get into a space that's affirming, but sometimes that becomes a trade-off when you only have so much time in your day, right? Um, I'm a member of this committee, this committee, that committee, and um, for different purposes. And then, you know, at, at a certain point, you have to be strategic about what committees you're on and how you're involved with the Bar Association, because you do also need that to be involved in the substantive areas that will help you professionally. And I just say that to make a point that, um, you know, for the for the audience that 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 is often the trade off. I feel like as an attorney of color that I experience is, um, you know, when you are maybe feeling um, isolated or you don't see people that look like you, you have to then make sure you go get that somewhere. But then um, you also need to focus on the things that are going to advance you professionally. And for you know a white attorney that doesn't necessarily they don't necessarily have to make that trade off all of the time, um, you know that may not be a consideration because they may be able to get both things in one place. So I just wanted to comment on that um, because I, I Daniel I definitely think you're right, um, and sometimes that's been a struggle for me to to manage all of those needs um, with a limited amount of time. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like um, as a first generation immigrant woman of color, how many other you know identity boxes can I check off? I, I've always felt a sense of um, community service. And I'm starting now to say no and recognize the value of me just existing and that being okay. And, um, and the value of replenishing myself in my own personal ways, even outside of having um, these other committees or communities or things like that that I'm doing, um, taking a step back and recognizing the value of replenishing just my myself, my own mental and my physical health, um, and, and doing those types of things has just been really, really important. Um, and I wanted to give a shout out as a fellow BLI alum, and I know Patrice also did, and I, I see some of my um, BLI class members, Mike and Don on, so I'll give a shout out to them too. BLI was really a great experience. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that even in this time of COVID, they're able to move ahead. Dylan, the last question I'll have is, um, uh, uh, I guess another question about bar association. So the last question will go to you. Um, how, what can the Bar Association do to connect more with law students? 
Um, well, I guess just more outreach uh, in general. I know um, I was fortunate enough to get my position through the Delphin County Bar Association Camp One L program, um, and you know that was is a diversity effort to see to get more diverse individuals in law firms around the um, Harrisburg Dauphin County area. So I definitely think you know things like that help. Um, so I guess Pennsylvania Bar Association's turn, um, PBA's turn. But. Great. Okay. Thank, thank you, Dylan. And um, we are out of time. So at, because we started a little late, we went a little late. Um, and so I guess I will hand it over to Andrea to lead us through to the lunch break. I don't want to prevent anyone from getting their lunch on time. Oh, wonderful, Sharon. You are fantastic. Great panel. Thank you for that first, the multi-generational perspective. Uh, we will now have a lunch break for 25 minutes, and we're going to start again at one o'clock. Uh, and so we invite you to get some replenishment uh, with some uh, nutrition and beverages, and we're going to hit the afternoon, and we're going to start digging in more with resources and action plans. See you, see you in about 25 minutes. <laughs>